Okay, so I'm going to be covering both types of brachytherapy today, both low dose rate and high dose rate. And I've entitled this What You Need to Know. One of the things I'll point out at the beginning is people often kind of abbreviate these as low dose and high dose. And um, that's actually quite wrong because the low dose rate brachytherapy gives a much higher dose than the high dose rate does. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive to what you would think. Uh, so let's look at some statistics for cancer in Canada to start with. There were over 200,000 new cases of cancer in Canada three years ago. Those are the most recent statistics we have. And about half of these are a combination of lung, colon, breast, and prostate. Those are the four biggies. That's, that's what we see most of. And prostate cancer accounts for one-fifth of cancers in men. Breast cancer accounts for a quarter of cancers in women. And these are actually very similar cancers. They're both adenocarcinomas of glandular origin. Um, when you talk about something that's a squamous carcinoma, like head and neck or lung or cervix, that's epithelial origin. So they're different basic cells that give rise to these cancers. Hematologic cancers start in blood or lymph cells. And sarcomas are of what we call mesenchymal origin, bone, fat, cartilage, or connective tissues. So the adenocarcinomas, like breast and prostate, start in glands. Um, and uh, these are glands that in the breast make milk and in the prostate make semen. And both these cancers have hormonal sensitivity. Breast cancers have uh, receptors on their cells for both estrogen and progesterone, and that's why anti-estrogenic agents such as tamoxifen are often part of treatment. In postmenopausal women, we use another type of uh, hormonal treatment called an aromatase inhibitor, which blocks the conversion of adrenal androgens to estrogen. And both these pathways are very similar to what we use in prostate cancer. Prostate cancer cells have androgen receptors. Androgens are the male hormone equivalent of estrogen. And so antiandrogens will block these receptors and inhibit growth. And the other type of hormone therapy that we use, which is called an LHRH, which stands for luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, agonist or antagonist, block the release of these uh, central brain hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to prevent testosterone production. And that's why the anti-hormone treatment that we use in prostate cancer is often a combination of a pill, which blocks the receptors, something like Casidex, bicalutamide, and an injection, which is the LHRH agonist or antagonist part of it, which is blocking the central release of the brain hormones that stimulate testosterone production. So we're blocking it centrally and peripherally in the, at the cellular level. So the basic treatment paradigm for, for prostate cancer is you're usually diagnosed with a transrectal ultrasound and biopsy. And if everything is favorable and is very low grade and small and your PSA is, is quite low, you might be offered active surveillance. You probably will be offered that. And people just keep an eye on it because it's not something that's going to bother you or shorten your life in the next decades. Um, if it's more aggressive looking, it's a higher grade or there's more of it or your PSA is higher, then you'll have some staging tests, which could include a CT scan, a bone scan, or even an MRI. And then a decision is going to be made if, because you're going to have to proceed to treatment, whether you're going to take a surgically based approach or a radiation based approach. And surgery is removing the prostate, plus or minus the lymph nodes, and then going on to radiation or the endocrine hormone treatment. And the radiation-based approach can be either one of any of these things or a combination. So it can be external beam radiation, it can be internal radiation called brachytherapy, or it could be a combination of the two. And you may or may not also need the hormone treatment. So that's the basic structure of the, the, the treatment plan. And if you're having the radiation-based approach, the dose of radiation is essential in the success of treatment, obviously. So what is brachytherapy for the prostate? When did it start and why do we do this? 
Well, brachytherapy in general is putting the radiation sources directly into the cancer. External radiation beams radiation in from the outside. So you lie down on the couch under a big machine and these beams come in from all directions and they're all pointing at the area that needs to be treated uh, within your body. But brachytherapy treats from the inside out. So it's putting the radiation directly into the cancer. And this obviously seems like a pretty good idea. And it started way back 50 years ago in the 1970s uh, in Memorial in New York using first a freehand technique. They didn't have the technology then to, uh, to plan things and, and, and distribute them properly and, and didn't have all the support structure that we have now for doing excellent quality implants. So they just said, well, we wanna put these sources into the prostate, so this is what we'll do. We'll use needles and we'll put them in. And it was done freehand. Um, and then in the 1980s, people had been thinking about this and, and from basically centered in Seattle, they worked out a way to, to plan the distribution of the seeds um, and to guide the distribution using transrectal ultrasound. And that became very successful And between 1990 and 2010, a lot of men were treated with brachytherapy and it was a highly, highly successful technique. And this was all of the low dose rate type or the permanent seed implant. Um, but then in the soon after 2010, the idea of active surveillance became known and much more popular. There was evidence for it that, hey, some of these things that we're calling prostate cancer, early stage prostate cancer, can sit there for decades and not spread. Um, so maybe we shouldn't be treating these men. Maybe we shouldn't be doing something aggressive. Maybe we should be watching them. And so that grew in popularity and as evidence accumulated. And so that, uh, you know, a lot of men who had been treated with either surgery or brachytherapy were now being watched for, you know, five or 10 years before they required treatment. And in the surgical field, the other progress that was made is that radical prostatectomies, the surgery that's done became robotic. And this is both in the United States and Canada. And along the same timeline, there were major technical improvements in external beam radiation to improve the focus and the precision of the delivery of the radiation. Uh, back in the, the 70s and 80s, when we used external radiation, it was very few fields. It was usually most common was what's called a four field technique, where there's one from the front and one from each side and one from the back, and they make kind of a box of radiation within you, and the prostate's rattling around somewhere in the middle, and the dose that you can give is very limited because there's all this other normal stuff in the way that you don't want to treat. So we had to learn how to focus these beams and give them precisely and developed what's called intensity modulated radiation therapy and stereotactic body radiotherapy or SBRT. And both of these are widely used in our standard of care today for the external treatments. So when prostate brachytherapy started off in the 1970s, I mentioned it was a freehand technique and you can see the picture on the left shows uh, the surgeon or the person doing the procedure and he's actually pushing these needles. The prostate is right here where the arrow is, if you can see my arrow, and he's pushing needles into that and he has his finger in the rectum so that he doesn't go too far and push them into the rectum. So he's telling, when he, when he feels the needle point at his finger, he says, oh, okay, that's fine enough. We'll, we'll start putting the seeds in. So it was, you know, pretty hit and miss to, to say the least. And you can see on the picture on the right, these little white dots here, this is a balloon in the bladder and these are supposed to be isodoses. And the little white dots show the distribution of the seeds which are pretty haphazardly uh, strewn around in the prostate, uh, giving some dose, that's true, but not in any kind of identified pattern. As opposed to our mo modern permanent seed implants, where you can see every, this is the basically the size of your prostate here, and these seeds are embedded within it and just outside it, and the uh, the image of the seeds actually kind of looks like a prostate because they're distributed evenly throughout it. So you get a much more even dose distribution and you're much more certain of treating everything you want to treat. So that was just our lead in. What are we going to be talking about this morning? Well, I want to review the importance of getting a high enough dose of radiation into the prostate to have successful treatment for prostate cancer. 
and also review how do we define success? And then how does the low dose rate prostate seed implants compare to the high dose rate temporary implant? How is each one performed? What can you expect from each of them? And how do these compare to surgery, which is your other main option? If you think of my schema of, of your, your treatment plan, it was there was sort of a fork in the road and you could go towards surgery, you could go towards radiation. So we'll, we'll circle back to that at the end. So the, the bottom line here is that when you're treating from the inside out with brachytherapy, you have the ultimate form of what we call conformal dose escalation. That means high dose radiation that conforms to the area that you wanna treat. So how do we define the challenge for effective radiation? Well, the maximum safe dose of radiation you can give to the prostate is gonna be limited by what the adjacent normal organs can tolerate because you've got the rectum right behind, you've got the bladder sitting on top, the urethra going through the middle, and you have to respect what these organs can take uh, while you're treating the prostate in order, like you wanna cure the cancer, but the guy still has to be functioning afterwards. So you have to make sure that you don't overdose these other structures and cause long-term disabilities, which are uh, you know, gonna be very detrimental to quality of life. And even at the high doses that we can give uh, using intensity modulated radiation these days, and with standard fractionation, we can take people up to 78 gray, 81 gray um, for the intermediate and high risk patients, about half of them will have a rising PSA 10 years later. And that occurs whether or not you use anti-hormone treatment up front. So it's a, it's a good short-term measure uh, you know, it's going to work for five, eight years, but by 10 years, about half the men are going to, you know, be demonstrating evidence that maybe they're not actually cured. And if they're not cured, where's it coming back? Well, the predominant site of where the cancer comes back seven, eight, 10 years later is in the prostate at the original site of the dominant lesion, the nodule that you felt, the, where the biopsies were positive, that's where it comes back, right in the heart of it, not usually somewhere else. And this is just um, a study that showed this very uh, elegantly. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see baseline MRI scans. So this gray smudgy thing here that I'm circling, and I hope you, can you see my arrow, by the way? Can you see the arrow? Sorry, we had to unmute. Uh, yes, we could see your arrow. Uh, okay, everything, good. Everything's Excellent. looking really good, going fine. Oh, okay, all right. So this gray smudgy thing here is the prostate and this darker area down here, you see it's white all along here and this is dark. Well, that's with the original cancer. And the person got radiation treatment and several years later had a recurrence. They did another MRI and this is not as clear because they've had the previous radiation, but again, you can see a site of recurrence there. So then they had the prostate taken out and that's exactly where the tumor was, right in the original spot. And another example here, this is the prostate. This dark area here is the cancer. When it comes back, you can see a dark area here on MRI. And there it is when they took the prostate out, the still original cancer to come back right where it had started, despite the radiation. And again, here, the original cancer, here when it came back, and here when they did a salvage prostatectomy after his radiation. So it just shows you that with our standard doses of external beam radiotherapy, although it may work for a few years, if you don't give enough, there's gonna be a nidus of cancer left behind and given enough time, that's gonna grow back and cause a recurrence of the cancer right at that original site. So how do we get a high enough dose in there? Well, you have to use very narrow margins of your treatment around your target, because if you have a wider margin of security, then you've included more of the rectum and the bladder and the other stuff that you don't want to treat and that's sensitive to treatment. And you have to be extremely accurate in how you deliver it in order to, again, not give dose to these uh, innocent bystanding organs. So your administration has to be precise um, the definition and targeting of the prostate has to be accurate and reproducible. And prostate movement during and between treatments has to be minimized, accounted for, attract. What do you mean prostate movement? You've got this organ sitting back down in the bottom of your pelvis. Where is it going to move to? Well, it, can, it is actually quite mobile. 
Um, if your rectum is full, it pushes the prostate anteriorly towards the front. If your bladder is full, it can push the prostate down. And it can have up to several, well, se easily several millimeters, even up to a centimeter of movement within that little area where it lives. And if you're talking about margins of treatment that are, you know, three to five millimeters, then you better be accurate each day, depending on the bladder and rectal filling that day, if you're going to deliver the treatment the way you want to. So I mentioned the advances in radiotherapy and planning software and imaging, which first gave us 3D conformal radiation and then intensity modulated radiation. And then finally, the one we use most commonly now is called VMAT, which is volume, volumetric modulated arc therapy, uh, which works basically in the same principle as intensity modulated. And all these forms of shaping our radiation beam reduce the toxicity and allow us to give a higher dose. And if you've reduced toxicity and you're giving a higher dose, then you can give a higher dose per fraction. You can, you don't, you're not limited to our usual standard fractionation because the radiation is all going in where you want it and you're not worrying so much about the rectum and the bladder and everything else. So you can give a bigger dose each day and decrease your overall treatment time. So instead of eight weeks of treatment, hey, we can cut it down to five and a half weeks. And with some of the more recent developments like SABER, the SBRT, um, you can cut it down even more than that and give fractions that are large enough that you can be finished in 10 days. Um, and this has led to uh, names, and, you know, CyberKnife is just a, um, you know, one of the types of machines they have for doing this. And protons are another thing, but that's just a a fancy way of directing the radiation. It's a different type of radiation beam, but it's not any, it's still an external beam type of radiation treatment. So with all these advances of IMRT and VMAT and SABER, do we still need brachytherapy? And the answer is yes. And because it's only with brachytherapy that we really get that sufficient dose to that area where the cancer started. And it has to be what we call an ablative treatment. It has to get those PSAs down into basically a surgical range. If you have your prostate out, you expect your PSA to be zero and it's supposed to be zero. And if it's not zero, there's a problem. And we have to get down into that same range with our radiation if we've gotten rid of all that malignant tissue which can potentially come back. So we need to get our PSAs down to the 0, 0.0 something range in order to have long-term success. And back in 2013, seven years ago, um, Lowell and, and others uh, from Vancouver looked at the BC database for uh, permanent seed implants and just looked at, well, okay, how low did the PSA go after the implant? And then what happened to these guys? And if your PSA didn't get below one, well, you know, you're finished. I mean, you know, everybody recurs. Like this is the rate of people that are still free of cancer and it, it just goes down, down, down. So the time, like this is five years here though, where my arrow is, and this is uh, almost seven years. So by seven years, everybody's failed if the PSA doesn't get below zero, or sorry, below one. Well, what if it's between 0.4 and one? Well, you do better, like, um, you know, 70% of men still may be free of cancer. And if it's 0.2 to 0.4, it's not so bad. If it gets less than 0.2 though, you have the best chance of being free of disease 10 or 12 years after your treatment. And this was based on 1400 men who'd been treated with brachytherapy in British Columbia. So it just shows the importance of getting your PSA low enough, giving enough dose to drive it low enough that you actually did get rid of all the cancer. And this was a similar analysis done in Toronto for uh, the group from uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, Elou and, and Morton, um, and they looked at it with uh, using HDR brachytherapy. And this was in higher risk patients, so it was used in combination with external radiation. But again, they divided the PSA up similar to what uh, Lowe had done. And you can see if the PSA didn't get below 0.8, the failure rate was really high uh, between 0.4 and 0.8. They were better, you had a 50-50 chance. But if it was less than 0.2, 
you know, out at 11 years, you've got like a 97% free of disease. So again, it shows the importance of getting enough dose in there. And you can do that with either a seed implant or a high dose rate temporary implant. So next thing we have to get across is that all prostate cancer is not the same. We talked about active surveillance and some of these so-called cancers can be safely watched for decades. And as long as you've got your eyes open and it's followed carefully, you're not gonna miss the boat to cure it if things should change. Um, so the surveillance is still a very, very important part of management. And others of what that intermediate category, um, we can cure quite simply by a single modality of treatment like surgery or brachytherapy. They're both gonna work very, very well. But others are more serious. Um, they're more aggressive, they may be more advanced, and you're gonna to have to combine modalities in order to get the best results. And those are the ones we call potentially lethal cancer. The relatively harmless ones are the ones we watch, the potentially lethal ones we have to throw the book at. So the non-lethal ones are the Gleason 6, detected through screening, can be safely watched often for decades, generally managed with active surveillance. And they gave PSA screening a bad name because initially when all these so-called cancers were found, we didn't know about active surveillance. We didn't know about the behavior of these Gleason 6 cancers. And uh, so everyone was treated. They said, well, we shouldn't screen because we're treating too many people. Well, you screen, you find them, and then you manage them appropriately. Um, the potentially lethal prostate cancer, on the other hand, is the Gleason 8 to 10, or even a Gleason 7, um, if it's a more aggressive 7. And these can only be detected at a curable stage if you're doing the screening. Because if you wait and you don't get your PSA done because you're afraid to go to a lab because of COVID, um, and you, know, you miss two or three years, I mean, it can, it can make a difference. These need effective and aggressive management. So lethal prostate cancer needs to be taken seriously. And what's the best way of getting rid of it permanently? Well, if you're using a radiation-based approach, this was a study done uh, in British Columbia here by my colleague in Vancouver, uh, James Morris. It was called the ASCEND trial. And what they did, they had 400 men with these potentially lethal prostate cancers, and they randomized them to a, everybody got a year of anti-hormone treatment. And then half the men got external radiation to the prostate, initially to the pelvis for four and a half weeks, and then another two and a half weeks to the prostate alone. Or after their, ex, after their pelvic radiation, they got brachytherapy. So this was a, a combination arm here with external to the pelvis plus brachytherapy to the prostate. And the reason you're combining them here, if brachytherapy is so great and you're treating from the inside out, why are we using external beam at all? It's a good question. It's for spatial cooperation because the brachytherapy is only going to treat the prostate. And when you have these potentially lethal aggressive cancers, there is a significant risk that you could have something already even in the lymph nodes uh, that's not, even though your staging is clear and it's not been detected on your CT or your bone scan, you could have something in your lymph glands, in your pelvis. And so the way to treat those is treat them up front with external radiation and then give the brachytherapy to ensure that you've got the optimal dose to the prostate. So anyway, these 400 men were randomized, 200 in each arm between either totally external radiation or external plus brachytherapy. And this is what happened in their progression-free survival. The arm that had the brachytherapy added on did much, much better. They're the curve in uh, red here. And you can see that 90% out at 10 years are still free of disease. Whereas if they only had the dose, the dose escalated external radiation, they start failing at about five years and they just keep on continually going down. So by nine years, if you had brachytherapy, 83% were free of tumor, whereas only 60% if you didn't get the brachytherapy. So that's a big difference. And if you use the PSA level that I was just pointing out that you have to reach, that if you, you have to get less than 0.2 in order to have a sustainable result. If you look at the percentage of men that had who actually achieved a PSA less than 0.2 with their treatment, if they had brachytherapy, 
it's 82% here out of 10 years, well, nine years. Um, and if they had just the external radiation, it's only a third of them that got to that level, which means, you know, if they, they live on for another several years, the, the cancer is eventually going to declare itself and come back. So it was only by adding in the BRCA therapy that we were able to get to that PSA level. So some of you may be aware of um, the current definition for cure with radiation. Um, when, you're, when you're treated, your PSA comes down, 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 down. And if it, you start to have a recurrence, it starts going up again. And if it gets two points above its low point, that's what we call nadir plus two. That's the current definition for um, a, a recurrence of your cancer um, if you've had radiation treatment. But uh, recently we have developed and published what really should be the biochemical definition of cure if you've had brachytherapy for your prostate cancer. And so what we did was we looked at patient data from seven institutions in Canada, the United States and Europe, and how the, all these men had brachytherapy and they were followed with their PSA and outcome and whether or not it recurred. So we ended up with over 14,000 men Almost 9,000 of them had brachytherapy alone. 3,000 had brachytherapy plus hormone therapy. Um, 1,100 had external radiation plus brachytherapy. And 1,300 had all three because they had the more aggressive disease. So they had the anti-hormone treatment, external radiation, and the seed implant brachytherapy. So all these 14,000 men had brachytherapy, but they, present, they represented a mix of stages and presentations. And if you look at their PSA five years after treatment, 86% of them reached a PSA of less than or equal to 0.2. And that, remember, is what we were defining as cure. And if they did get to a level of 0.2 or lower, then 99% of them were free of cancer at 10 years and 97% free of cancer 15 years later. So this is our definition of cure. It goes back to those two studies I showed, one with the brachytherapy, one with the HDR. 0.2 is our goal. However, if you don't quite make 0.2, if you're, if like you're between 0.2 and 0.5, you still have a pretty good chance. You know, 90, this was only 6% of the men that were in this category, but still over 90% are gonna be free of cancer at 10 years and 85% at 15 years. If it's between 0.5 and 1, and this was only 2.5% of the men, then 80% will make it to 10 years without cancer. But by 15 years, it's only 60%. And again, if you're over 1, and this was 5%, then you know not everybody fails. But by 10 years, only 43% were free of their cancer, and just over 20% by 15 years. So again, this shows the importance of getting down to that low PSA level. And this was a, a huge amount of data. There were uh, 2,800 patients that were still in follow-up after 10 years. And the median PSA for these men, both at 10 and 15 years after their brachytherapy was 0 0.01. So that's basically a surgical definition of cure. That's, that, that shows how ablative brachytherapy is. And all these men had the seed implant type of brachytherapy. We're going to do the same thing for HDR, but we don't have it yet. So this shows the curves of the 7,800 patients uh, based on what their PSA was. So if their PSA, and this is five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, if the PSA got to less than 0.2 by five years, um, this shows how many remained free of evidence of recurrence. And that's where you get your like 97%. If it was 0.2 to 0.5, they still did okay, but there were more failures, 0.5 to 1, and then if it didn't get less than 1. So this just shows the sustained follow-up for these men. So the take-home points from that, from so far, is that this LDR, low-dose rate, seed brachytherapy, is associated with very low post-treatment PSAs. More than 80% of patients, and this is across all risk groups and it includes those with the worst tumors, will achieve a PSA less than or equal to 0.2 nanograms per mil by four to five years. 
And if you get to that level, you have a 99% chance of being free of clinical failure at 10 to 15 years, which is, you know, is, is, that's really reassuring. And so that's why achieving a PSA of less than or equal to 0.2 should be adopted as our biochemical definition of cure for comparison with surgical series. Because if you have surgery and if your PSA rises to above 0.2, that's what they consider a failure. So it puts us basically on a, a level playing field because we're now you talking about the same PSA levels instead of this, well, we have to wait from the lowest point till it rises to two points above, et cetera, et cetera. It adds a big time lag in there. So it makes it much easier to compare surgical and uh, radiation results. So how is this LDR brachytherapy done? Well, this is just a schematic here. So um, there's a transrectal ultrasound probe in the tail end in the rectum. This is a prostate right here. There's a template attached to the holder for the probe and we insert needles under ultrasound guidance through the template up into the prostate and deposit the seeds within the prostate according to uh, the planned pattern that we've developed. This is just another cutaway view. This thing that looks like a strawberry is actually the prostate with the seeds distributed through it. Um, and it shows the template again, and we're inserting needles through it. We can see what we're doing because the ultrasound is showing us here. And we get up to the top of the prostate, withdraw the needle and leave behind the chain of seeds. Um, so if you were gonna have this treatment, you see a radiation oncologist, you see the anesthetist, you have a transrectal ultrasound to map out your prostate, the size and shape, so we can plan the treatment, plan how many needles, how many seeds, where to put the seeds. And the implant procedure usually occurs three to four weeks later. It's gonna be under anesthesia. Um, it's an outpatient procedure. It takes just over an hour. You go home the same day. It can be either general or spinal anesthesia, but that's usually the anesthetist choice. Um, Follow up, we do a PSA every three months for the first couple of years, then every six months and annually after five years. And visits are as required every six to 12 months, depending on how you're doing and if you have any questions or symptoms. And now a lot of these visits are done by phone. So it's a, a one hour procedure, you're home two or three hours afterwards. It's under general or spinal anesthetic. And most men are gonna be back to their normal activities within a day or two, they can be back at work. Sexual function as for surgery is gonna depend on the age and the function level at the time of the procedure. It's not gonna make it better. Um, there's about a 15% loss in the first year. And then after that, just age-related decline. I mean, we can't guarantee that we'll keep you potent until you're 90, but um, so we're not gonna be able to slow down the normal attrition with age, but apart from that initial step down in the first year, then it pretty much follows the pattern that you would expect as men go from 65 to 75 to 85. Um, and the LDR brachytherapy is associated with excellent long-term cure, as I've just shown you with all those graphs with undetectable PSA to 10 years and beyond. Um, you do get some urinary frequency and urgency, which lasts three to four months because these seeds deliver the radiation over a six month period. So about 5% of men may need a urinary catheter for a few days. 15% um, will have worse urinary function at one to two years, but it's down to 5% by three years. 50% of the men are back to normal urinary function within six months, but there is this obligatory three, four, five months when you have these nuisance symptoms of having to go more often and with more urgency. Uh, you can still go about your normal business, but um, you just have to pay more attention, know where the washroom is, you know, pee before you get in the car, don't have two cups of coffee and then get in the car, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Long-term, uh, what we call stricture rates, narrowing of the urethra because of the radiation is about 2%. Bowel symptoms are quite uncommon, less than 10% acutely, and these will resolve on their own within a few weeks. And rectal bleeding is, you know, in, in my experience, about 2%. And most of these resolve with medical management, um, just some special creams or suppositories. Uh, bowel ulcers have been reported. Um, the rate is somewhere around one in a thousand, but it depends a lot on the um, experience 
and of the operator and the technique. Um, <clears throat> sexual function, your age and the pretreatment function are important to the chances of preserving erectile function after treatment. Younger patients under 60 with good sexual function pretreatment have about an 80 to 90% chance of preserving sexual function later um, out to five years and beyond. Um, I had one patient saying, well, I have to wait five years for it to come back. No, no, that just means, you know, it's there right after the treatment and by five years, things are still working. Um, older patients, unfortunately, it's not good news. The, the function, even if present, is often not quite as robust. And so their chances of maintaining adequate erectile function afterwards are probably in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 percent. Um, but overall, about half of the men who have brachytherapy will benefit from Viagra type medications. These will help with erections. Um, and we talk about this at follow up visits and give you samples if you want to try them. Um, and they will help preserve your, your uh, sexual function. And the thing to remember is sexual function is age related even without treatment. So let's move on to the high dose rate type of brachytherapy now. And how is that different from the seed implants? The high dose rate brachytherapy is a temporary implant. So no radioactivity stays in your body. It's uh, similar in other respects to the LDR procedure. It's under, it's under anesthesia, it's under ultrasound guidance, I'm sticking needles, into the prostate, but instead of putting in a needle and depositing a bunch of seeds, I create a scaffolding of needles, usually 16 in a parallel array and a defined pattern in the prostate, so they're distributed around it. Um, and then when those are all in place, a, a single very potent radioactive seed comes from an afterloader that's beside you in the room and negotiates its way through each of these needles, just kind of stepping through and pausing for the right length of time at each place to give the required dose and then whips back into the machine and into the next needle and steps through that. And it goes in little three millimeter steps. So it's, it's a very sort of smooth transition. And the time that it's stopping may be as short as like half a second or one or two seconds. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's programmed to do that, to deliver the the full uh, dose that we want to you to receive. And that seed is 10,000 times stronger than the seeds we leave in permanently. So it's this one seed, we use the same one for multiple patients over three months and then we get a new one. Um, when you have this kind of way of delivering treatment, dose shaping or dose sculpting is really easy to do because if we know where the cancer is, then we just have the seed sit there for an extra few seconds and it's going to give a lot more dose to that area of the, of the cancer. So this is how this looks. There's a template here that's up against your, your perineal skin and we're inserting this array of needles through that template. This is what we see on the ultrasound picture. So we can see this is the prostate, this dark shape here, the urethra is here in the center, your ultrasound probe is down here. This is the rectal wall. So these white spots are where the needles are arriving and these green spots are where we're planning to put the last four needles. So we can see exactly what we're doing there. And then we can look at it on a sagittal view. Uh, this is the apex of the prostate. This is the top end, the base, the bladder's up here, the rectum's down here. So we can follow these needle tracks along and map the course of each needle and then plan the actual delivery of the radiation dose from this seed that's going to travel up each of these needles. This is just a reconstruction of the prostate and how the needles are placed. And this is, the needles are all in place, they're locked into this template, and these transfer tubes connect it to the machine that has the single radioactive source, which will then travel through each of these in turn, step through the prostate, then back in, then into the next one, etc., until it's done all 16. So some of the advantages of HDR over alternative forms of treatment is if you're using external beam, the dose is limited, even no, no matter how well you shape the beam. Um, there's a worrisome integral dose, especially with treatments like intensity modulated or stereotactic or volumetric modulated arc. And by integral dose, I mean the whole radiation dose that the body of the person receives while they're getting their treatment to their prostate. 
with external radiation, there's going to be some inaccuracy that's inherent due to the unpredictable prostate motion between fractions or even during one fraction, because sometimes these specially uh, modulated treatments can take eight or 10 minutes. Um, you can't focally increase dose to more than one area in the prostate, and sometimes prostate cancers are in more than one place, like you have a little bit in both sides, so you want to increase dose to both. And that's harder to do if you're using external beam to, to shape your dose. And you never know exactly what you delivered and where because you have no way of knowing exactly where the prostate was at the time the beam was on. With permanent seed implants, which are an excellent form of treatment, you do, you, there is a risk of some seed loss or migration. This is rare and it's usually not a big deal. Like one seed in a thousand can migrate. Um, it, you know, and, if you've had 100 seeds put in and you lose one, it doesn't make any noticeable difference in your dosimetry coverage, but it can happen. Operator performance is key. Um, just like in surgery, the skill of your surgeon is really important. With permanent seed implants, you know, the more you've done, the more careful you are, the better you know your, your technique, the better it's going to be. And the final thing is when we evaluate the quality of the implant, the seeds are already in and we can't take them out. We can only add more if a spot was missed. With HDR, you don't have any of those problems. So this is how things look with the high dose rate brachytherapy. This red thing is the prostate, and this shows our delivery of dose. This thing is the urethra, and you can see how the dose is curving around the urethra, so we're keeping it below the limit that we, it can tolerate. This is the rectum back here, and it's hardly getting any dose at all. Our prescription dose is way up here. So you can, you can shape that, and if you know where your your cancer is, say the cancer's right here, then you can give you know, much more dose to that just by turning on the, the source as it travels through those three needles. So how does this compare with um, other forms of focused radiation? So this would be HDR brachytherapy here. Um, the prostate would be in the middle of where this dose is. This is stereotactic body radiotherapy here. And this is an external beam technique that's focused where you give a few very, very large fractions. It can be uh, three times a week or they can be once per week, but it's um, it, like you, 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 your treatment's over in five fractions rather than going on for like um, 28 or something. Um, so the, the dose here is very concentrated on the prostate, but there's all this lower level dose throughout your body. And this was what happens with VMAT. This represents your 50% isodose line here. So again, the prostate's receiving this nice high dose conformal radiation, but there's a lot of extraneous dose delivered um, as that arc travels around to uh, focus, to give its focus dose at, at this point. And even with our best saber, or stereotactic body radiotherapy is not as ablative as the, bra the brachytherapy is. Because for a, a large series, I think it was about 1,200 patients, PSA at five years, the median was 0 0.47, which is, isn't bad, but it's 0 0.05 if you use a permanent seed implant. Um, recently, there was a comparison of whole body integral dose using these three techniques the volumetric modulated arc that we use for external beam, stereotactic body radiotherapy or SABER, and the high dose rate brachytherapy. Of these three, the first two are external. The final one is your brachytherapy treating from the inside out. And both VMAT and SABER have to penetrate normal tissue to get to their target. And so uh, in this analysis, it was like 10 patients and they just calculated what would be received by the whole body if they had their treatment either from VMAT, Sabre, or HDR. Using HDR reduced by 80% the integral whole body dose that was received compared to VMAT, and it reduced the integral dose by 65% compared to Sabre. And so that's important because what is that integral dose too? Well, it doesn't cause you a lot of symptoms, but we know we, people don't like to talk about this, but we know that radiation does cause cancer, uh, especially low-dose radiation. And if you receive low-dose radiation and you're, you know, early in your life, then 20 years later, you have a risk of getting cancer. Well, the low-dose radiation you receive for prostate cancer treatment from this integral dose from the type of radiation could have consequences, not right away, but, you know, 
10, 15 years down the road. So we're concerned about these interval doses because we don't have that kind of follow-up yet for these types of radiation modalities. So with HDR, oops, we do intraoperative planning. So the physicist is in the room. We're looking at this, so we're designing our, our radiation coverage there. We're making sure that the computer's calculated things and we can tweak it and um, make it just you know, uh, custom made as we want. Um, if you compare the type of dose received, this is what we plan to deliver with a seed implant. And this is what we do deliver with HDR. So we're following this very same principles, except with HDR, this is exactly what is being delivered. With LDR, this is what's being planned. And hopefully you're going to be close to it, but it's going to depend exactly how these seeds end up because you're depositing them and they have, to, they have to stay where you put them. How does prostate MRI come into this? Well, multiparametric MRI is a huge advance in prostate imaging. This is a normal prostate here. This black part is a central zone that tends to enlarge as men get older and cause some grief with urination. This whitish part here is the peripheral zone and that's where cancers usually start. Not always, but usually. This is a prostate that has cancer in it. And you can see the central zone again. You can see the white peripheral zone and oops, there's a dark area here, that's the cancer. So you can tell whether it's going through the capsule of the prostate, you can tell how big it is, you can monitor it. Um, if you're, someone's on surveillance, you can measure it from year to year. Um, and if they're getting HDR, you can transfer this information to their planning ultrasound that they've had during the procedure and increase the dose to this area while respecting the dose to the urethra and the rectum. So how are, how are HDR and LDR similar? Well, the efficacy appears to be very similar. They both require a procedure under anesthesia. They're both under transrectal ultrasound guidance. The symptom afterwards are very similar and the light side effects are similar. Both of them are a high dose of radiation to the same area of your body. What are the differences? Well, much as I like HDR, there's longer experience and more patients treated with LDR. So it's a much more solid database to base our expectations on. And that can be important. With HDR, no radioactivity is going to stay in your body. So there are no precautions whatsoever. The precautions after an LDR implant are not excessive. It's only for the first two months. You have to stay six feet away from babies, pregnant women, and small children. I mean, it's just like we're doing social distancing for everybody now with COVID. But we do have these precautions, and sometimes that's a worry. And so you don't have that at all with HDR, because after you're done with it, the source is back in the machine for the next guy. What else is different? Well, the symptoms resolve more quickly after HDR. Uh, the symptoms, as I said, are very, very similar acutely. Um, but they're going to resolve more quickly because when you wake up after the procedure, your treatment's done. You're already in a recovery phase. Whereas if you have a seed implant, your treatment's only just beginning and it's going to go on for the next six months. Um, so with the HDR, the symptoms actually may be more intense for a short time, you know, the first day, the first few hours, but they're going to resolve within a matter of days. It's also, as I mentioned, easier to sculpt the dose to known sites of cancer through just varying the source dwell times. When that source is traveling through the needles, you just have it sit there for an extra three or four seconds and you know, there's a lot more dose to the site of cancer. The other thing that's different is that in HDR brachytherapy if used alone, without the addition of external radiation, it requires two procedures two weeks apart. Um, so it's not just a single procedure. Some people have done it as a single procedure. You can do that. It's safe, but it doesn't work as well. So it has to be two procedures, two weeks apart. Sometimes we do them one week apart, but it has to be two separate procedures. And since we've started doing this, there's been data coming out saying that the reason that that happens is that the first dose that you give, the first half of that treatment, um, actually upregulates 450 genes within the prostate cancer. And these are genes that make it more sensitive to subsequent radiation. They're genes for inflammation and apoptosis and things, you know, things that just make it much more easy to kill when you give the second dose of radiation a week or two later. So that's why it works better, but it does have to be two, two procedures. So what about surgery? Where does that fit into all this? 
Um, you'll likely see a surgeon first when you're diagnosed and he or she is likely to recommend surgery because that's what surgeons do. More and more though are saying, well, see your radiation oncologist and you know, come back and talk to me after or something, which is a good thing because surgery certainly is and, and can be a very good option. Um, but just for something to think about, um, this was published, it was seven years ago, but that's contemporary. Oncologic outcomes of radical prostatectomy in the era of active surveillance. And this was in a tertiary care Canadian University Center, uh, 2,600 patients, median age was 61. Uh, all had PSAs, uh, well, not all of them, but the, mean, the median PSA was seven. Most of them were early stage, either T1, which means you don't feel the tumor at all, or uh, T2, which is a small nodule. <clears throat> a third of them had the favorable type of cancer, more than half were intermediate, and 11% were the high risk, more aggressive ones. So it's a typical kind of spread that you would expect. And for the patients that were intermediate risk, which means basically your Gleason 7s, 60% were recurrence free at five years. And for the high risk patients, only 40% were recurrence free at five years. Now that's looking at just surgery by itself. It's not looking at the effect of when you add other treatments on top of it based on the pathology. So if you see the pathology was not favorable after you've done the surgery and you add radiation or you add anti-hormone treatment, then you're, you're gonna do better. But surgery by itself um, has a fairly high recurrence rate for both intermediate and high-risk disease. And this is another study um, for just looking at the ones, whoops, that are the, really the, the aggressive ones, the Gleason 8, 9, and 10. And this is from the John Hopkins uh, Center um, where Pat Walsh is the famous surgeon there. Everybody in the business has heard of him. And he did surgery as just monotherapy, surgery by itself on these guys with Gleason 8 to 10. We don't usually recommend that because now people say, well, you need multimodality treatment for these high-risk patients. If you start with surgery, then you should give radiation and or hormones after. And if you're using a radiation-based approach, you should add anti-hormone treatment and it should be a combination of external beam and brachytherapy. So we're much more accepting now of this multimodality approach for the high-risk patients. But in this era, um, which was 1982, 2004, they were just getting surgery by itself. And the five and 10 year biochemical recurrence free rates for these men who had surgery alone for Gleason eight to 10 were 40% at five years and 27% at 10 years. And if the pathology after the surgery was very favorable, so the tumor was all confined and the nodes were negative and everything else was good, even then the 10 year recurrence free rate was only 10, 50%. So this supports what we currently do, which is to recommend multimodality treatment for high-risk disease. So surgery first, followed by radiation plus or minus hormones, or if it's a non-surgical radiation-based approach, then it would be anti-hormones, external radiation plus brachytherapy. And I, that's, that's much more understood now in practice than it used to be even 10 years ago. So I, I mentioned this in, in passing as we were going through it, why do we combine external beam and brachytherapy? Whether we're using the low dose rate seeds or the high dose rate temporary implant, why do we combine them if, if it's so good and it's gonna sterilize cancer in the prostate, what do we need it for? Well, again, it's a spatial cooperation because the brachy can only treat the prostate and high risk, aggressive, advanced cancers have got, may have gone beyond the prostate. Even if your staging is favorable, they still may be there, we just can't see them yet. And so, the external radiation will treat those lymph node change and the tissues around the prostate and give you a better chance of the outcome that we want. And we're not getting into this in this talk, but things like PSMA PET for staging uh, prior to your treatment decision will help to tell us whether lymph nodes in the pelvis are involved and will help us to target those nodes. Unfortunately, this, we have limited access to that, so not everyone can get it, but it's coming. So the external beam radiation, this is what we mean by targeting lymph nodes. Uh, the area you're treating is this uh, U-shaped area here. This is the rectum back here, and this is the um, bladder. And as you get lower down in the pelvis, this is the prostate, rectum, whoops, rectum, rectum, prostate, bladder. You can see how close together they are, why it's such a, 
a nuisance and why you have to be so careful about how you deliver your dose. But this is treating the lymph nodes and periprostatic tissue here and here and including the prostate. And then you optimize prostate dose by adding in the brachytherapy. So in summary, there's a lot of information. Explore your options before you make a decision. Surgery may be a good choice, but the worse the cancer, the higher your PSA, the higher the Gleason score, the more likely it is that you're gonna need further treatment in addition to the surgery. Um, both high dose rate and low dose rate brachytherapy are established radiation modalities that increase the chances of successfully eradicating the cancer in the prostate as compared to external beam radiation techniques by themselves. And either of these types of brachytherapy can be used alone or in combination with external radiation. And they're both good treatment options. Thank you.